This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Coberline. Psychology has the power to tell us how we behave and what motivates us. But is it really that accurate? Or is it really just a statistical game? On our show today is Dr. Grant Guthiel, Associate Professor of Psychology at Nazareth College. He'll talk to us about the probabilistic nature of psychology. So here's one of the things that always gets me. We love talking about how psychology can can understand or read our minds. And psychologists we, never say that. <laughs> no, but non-psychologists do. Yes. And and we both love this and hate this. Yes. Because we want you to solve all of our problems. Yep. Why is it that psychology can't? Because psychology simply doesn't work that way. The science of psychology doesn't work that way. The first distinction I really have to make here is between academic or experimental research psychology on one side and okay. clinical psych on the other. Clinical psych is the, the diagnostic aspect yeah. of it. Clinical psych is all about you're a client, I'm a therapist, I'm going to crawl inside your head, help you figure out what's going on in there, and help you figure out how to fix you. Right. And that's, that's, I think, what most people think of when they think yeah. of psychology. And honestly, in a very real sense, they're right. If you, like, count it up, the number of psychologists in the world, the clinicians outnumber the rest of us about a gazillion to one. Okay. The problem is that the vast majority of the research on the human condition, on what makes us tick, how we think, how we feel, why we do what we do, is not done by clinicians. It's done by academic and experimental psychologists, and they function at a fundamentally different level. So okay. the clinician, it's all about you. If you're my client, I want to help you. Whatever I find out about you may or may not generalize to anybody else, but I'm okay. going to know a whole lot about you, assuming that the therapeutic relationship works, etc. So this is a best case scenario. So I can crawl inside your head, figure out what's going on in there, tell you fix this, 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 and this. Your life's going to get better. You go, yay, I get paid. Everybody's happy. If you're an academic psychologist, you're not interested in the behavior of one person. You're interested in the behavior of characteristics of groups of people. So if you're an academic psychologist, you want to know what people with a certain set of characteristics are most likely to do under a certain set of conditions. So we look at poverty, we look at child abuse, we look at divorce, alcoholism, happiness. And what we desperately want to know is, what are the characteristics that make certain behaviors or certain outcomes more or less likely? And the fancy word for likely is probable. And that gets, that's what gets us into our problem, is experimental or scientific psychology is a probabilistic science. Right. So if you can use some conditions to predict 70% of the outcomes, yeah. that's a success for you. Yeah. I mean, that's what we want. That's exactly what we are trying to do so if you know some smart 18 year old kid walks into an intro psych class and desperately wants the professor to tell them why their life is bad why they can't get a date why they can't get along with their mom when are they going to get a job how much money are they going to make <laughs> they want that crystal ball they want us to they want the psych professor to read their mind Right. And they get understandably really annoyed <laughs> when what that professor often and always should do is, I don't know. What I can tell you is if you look at people with the following characteristics, students with a certain GPA, certain set of study habits, certain socioeconomic background, certain set of interests that we can all measure and we know how to do this really well, are statistically more likely to have the following positive outcomes in their life. And the kid looks at you and goes, what? Why can't I get a date? And the psychologist takes a deep breath and says, I can't tell you about you. Let's try this again. Okay, but you are being able to say, well, if you do this behavior, like, yeah. like if you bathe regularly, if you uh, build up some self-esteem, you're going to be more likely. Yeah, but more likely is not what people more want. More likely isn't what they want. All right. People want yes or no. If I go to this class, get this grade, do these things, I get that job, I get that girl, I get that house, I get right. that vacation. That's what they want. Doesn't work that way. When they finally get that, first of all, they're really annoyed. And second of all, they have a really reasonable response to that of, well, this is complete BS. <laughs> this is stupid. Don't tell me 70% of people with so I want to know about me. 
it's not only, you know, 19 year old psych students who do this. Biologists do it. Chemists do it. Physicists right. do it. Well, I'm part glaring of right why. at you. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason they do it is, you know, the behavioral science of psychology is not a science. Why not? Because it's probabilistic. Right. Here's how Most this science works. is probabilistic. Yeah, but they don't want to play that game. <laughs> We're more probabilistic, and our variables are mushier. So they they tar us with this brush, which at least to some degree is valid. Okay. I mean, take an organic chemist, right? This is a guy who says, I put sodium and chloride together under laboratory conditions, and you know what happens? I get salt. Every I get salt time. every time. I don't get salt 70% of the time. I don't get salt on Tuesdays when it's raining. I get salt. Right. And if it doesn't work, it's because I screwed up. You know, I don't know why? Because I do science. <laughs> and they're not wrong. It's a very limited way to look at science, but they're not right. wrong. And let me right. tell you, man, I envy that at a cellular level. <laughs> you wish you could experiment with a million identical twins. <laughs> That's unethical, immoral, and illegal, and no one should ever, ever do it. But, oh my God, yes, can I have the, can I, can I have the computer simulation, please? That's actually, now that I think of it, kind of a cool idea. I gotta, yeah, forget that. Right. The reason people get mad at psychologists is because it is probabilistic, and probabilistic science, probabilistic data is a real limitation. In other parts of their lives, people are completely willing to take probabilistic results and believe them. Uh, the classic example here is anybody who's ever looked at a package of cigarettes. All right, You look at the warnings on a package of cigarettes, and basically, I can't even remember what they say, but if you ask anybody out there in the world, what do cigarettes say? Smoking causes cancer. Right. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. Utter, complete, and total lie. If smoking caused cancer, the following would occur. I would light up a cigarette, I would take a drag, I would inhale, and fall over dead. Doesn't happen. People know that, you know, their Uncle Harry has been smoking three packs a day for 40 years. He just ran a marathon. Right. There's always those exceptions exactly. to prove the rule. And that's what behavioral science is. Demographics, like they use for smoking and like they use for a whole lot of other stuff, is essentially psychology. It's right. essentially behavioral probabilistic science. But... The message that smoking causes cancer is so powerful and so useful, people will accept it. Right. As a there, summary of that statistical increase. Yeah. And okay. there are parts of our lives where that really works. But when you try it for divorce, when you try it for academic performance, let's go there for a while, <laughs> shall we? I don't know. You didn't learn anything in my class. How many times did you show up? Somebody started class recently. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is, that the, is it showing? <laughs> Honest to God, I love my students and I love my job, but there are times when, look, the, the thing I tell them is when you come to me, you don't have to show up to my class. I don't take attendance. But if you show up after not being there, it's the 10th week of the term. You come to my office or you come to class and you say, I'm going to fail. What can I do to fix that? All right. Sign up for class in spring. Yeah. Sign up for the class in spring. If I'm really, really snarky, I'll say, build a time machine. Oh, <laughs> you're done. So, Why? Because you didn't do the work. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. So there are things that are somewhat predictive. I mean, are there, are there any kind of really neat examples of, of where the psychology actually gives a really good, a really strong statistical oh, yeah. analysis? You won't like it, and people don't think it's psychology, but it works, and it's scary. Okay. Big data. Okay. You're on Amazon. You're looking for snow tires. You're shopping for snow tires. You click through this window. You click through that window. You've had it for about 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden, bloop, little window pops up that says, we notice you're looking for snow tires. We think you might be interested in the following products. And it's not that they're saying radiator hoses or wheel covers. Right. The products that they give you are big bags of cheddar cheese, right. fluffy pink slippers, and a new shampoo. pool. <laughs> Utterly random, silly stuff. Right. And then it gets scary. Because you go, Buffy slippers? That's still... Oh, wait a minute. Wow, those are nice. I could use a pair of puff... Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> They've just predicted you. Damn right. 
They watch what you do. They play the probabilistic game with god-awful amounts of data, and they do it really well. Right. And part of it's misleading, because if, if it doesn't flag for you, you think, oh, well, their, their algorithm is off. Yes. But when it does work, you think, wow, that's so spooky. It's spooky. It's scary. They're reading right. my mind. No, they're not. They're doing probabilistic data analysis right. on huge amounts of data, and they're really, really, really good at it. And they don't have to be that good to actually make money. No, it. man. It's like, it's not like if you're looking for snow tires, mystically, there's a 99% chance you need a big bag of cheese. <laughs> it's not that. It's straight. Uh, again, it's, it's like got, you read my mind. Yeah, it, right? <laughs> it's got nothing to do with you as an individual. Their algorithm says 13% of the people who are currently looking for snow tires and have this set of demographic characteristics that this individual has, and we know they do because we track their purchasing. Right. Also, need also cheese. <laughs> it's a 13% bump. So we'll throw up cheese and fuzzy slippers. If we get a hit just on a 13% increase, we win. Right. So right. when it, exactly, when it, when it works, it looks spooky. When it doesn't work, it looks stupid. And it's neither one of those things. It is hardcore probabilistic science. You're listening to One Universe at a Time. We're talking with Grant Guthiel about the statistical nature of psychology. Given that everything's statistic, you talked about big data and how we can analyze so many people in such detail. It kind of raises an interesting question for me, which is, in physics, we often, whether it's true or not, we kind of assume that deep down there is some underlying set of physical laws, that, that as physicists, as scientists, we try to discover what those actual physical laws are. But we assume they're there. Is the same thing apply in psychology? Do you think there's some absolute set of physical laws or anything that's there? Okay, I'm not going to give you a yes or no answer because we don't have one. That's okay. the first thing I'm going to say. Uh, the second thing is, it depends on how far you dig, how far down you go. And at some point, when you get an absolute set of physical laws, you're talking biology, not psychology. That's probably one good way to look at it. So, okay. are there absolute limits on a human brain at a biological, neurological level? Almost certainly. We just don't know what they are yet. But there right. have to be limits on computational capacity, processing speed. We don't know what they are yet. We, okay, we know some, but we don't know. What I'm trying to say is th there's this kind of pop psych notion out there that we only use 10% of our brain or right, that there's some right. mystical thing in our heads and if we could just wear little you know, tinfoil pyramid hats, we'll be able to talk to each other with our minds. Right. See, that's all nonsense. There are limitations on the wetware, on the biology that put fundamental limits on the behavior. But most psychologists will say, yeah, that's true. We're all bipedal. We all have certain limitations and certain skills. Yeah, but that's not interesting. And I don't think that's the question you're asking. Right. The question you're asking is, are there limits at a higher cognitive, social, or interpersonal level? And the answer to that is, we don't know yet. Right. We really, really don't. And we have fights about that. And the fights generally fall along subdivisions within the field. Okay. Psychology is a remarkably diverse or obnoxiously diverse field, depending upon <laughs> who you ask and what mood they're in. There are, quote, psychology departments at what are known as hard science universities. Let's take, I don't know, MIT, for example. Okay. And the brain and cognitive science department is quite separate, thank you, from the psychology. I'm not even sure MIT has a psych department. They probably they have a, do. They have a brain and cognitive science department. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you work there, the answer to the question you asked for those folks more likely than not is yes okay because what they're going to say is it's a matter of technology it's a matter of mapping the mind excuse right. me god i said mind kill me it's a matter of mapping the brain mind right. is a nebulous concept and therefore stupid right so mind mind is this abstraction forget it brain forget, yeah brain, brain is mapping neurons, neurons and synapses, baby you got it that. Okay. so if you take that viewpoint your idea is we don't know yet but we will we will know that we believe those limitations exist. We will find them. We will find them in the following way. We will develop the technology to map absolutely every meaningful aspect of a fully mature human brain. And right. then we will watch that brain make decisions and feel and go to the symphony and get into a car accident. 
And then you'll have your, your million identical people. And you got it. <laughs> and you will know there are limits. They are as powerful and as strong as the limits you guys in physics think are out there. And we're going to know what they are. Okay. That's one set of answers. There are neuroscientists who believe that that is not true. And there are a whole lot of psychologists who are not brain and cognitive science people who believe that is the stupidest idea they've ever heard for the following reason. Human behavior is complicated. It is not neuronally based exclusively. Yes, you can't behave without a brain that works. But consciousness exists. Mm -hmm. It doesn't arise from the neurons. Period. The end. There are behaviors, abilities, understandings, whether you want to call it spiritual capability, consciousness, or anything else, that even if you understand exactly how the hardware works, exactly how the biology works, you will not be able to predictably, one-to-one, -one, in the way I talked about a few minutes ago, you won't be able to make salt. Right. You won't be able to say, okay, if the hard science guys are right, if the neuroscience guys are right, here's what you should be able to do once you can map the brain. I am going to, at a very basic and stupid level, make you raise your right arm, whether you want to or not. Okay. By a, I'm tweak some tweak little neurons something, in my head and, and my arm thunk, goes up. And my arm goes up. That's going to happen. That already does happen in a lot of places. Right. But I'm going to tweak something in your brain and you're going to love Mozart. You've okay. been a headbanging crazy person your entire life, but I'm going to tweak your brain and you're going to love Mozart. Not Beethoven, not Sibelius. You're going to love Mozart. Okay. Now, they've done a little bit of this with memory, right? Where they've yes. like, erased memories or have they implanted but, memories? But it's very, oh, well, I do not believe, and okay, it's a good question. My The answer is I don't know the research well enough okay. to say. I will say they've done it with animals. Right. They've done it with it animals works. and they've erased memories. They've though. erased memories. There is okay. memory erasure work being done with humans, very specifically with PTSD right. as a treatment for PTSD. Right. And that is both brilliant and interesting and terrifying right and they can also do things like uh stimulate pleasure centers or oh, things like yeah. that oh yeah that's been going on for which a long is more time. abstract but yeah and also potentially evil but you know a pleasure center is an easy thing you, you find right. the right spot and because a pleasure center is not I cortical dopamine. It's, <laughs> it's lower down dopamine good man <laughs> so you you know put the probe in the right spot and you know someone's essentially a heroin addict because that's okay. what, what it feels like and you know science fiction has talked about that for years that right. can happen but pleasure center is easy raising your arm is easy making somebody like mozart is not right. easy how about this i will rewire the brain that you have so that you can now do differential equations where before you could not right when we can do that kind of stuff that's definitive proof in my mind that we are in fact meat robots and that we now know the rules of, of the human universe and that we can do whatever we want. It's, it's interesting because you say hardwiring someone to be able to do differential equations mm -hmm. to me would seem like it, it doesn't necessarily answer that. Whereas now how come? Well, because at a very basic level, being able to do differential equations is, is kind of a cognitive task. Yes. And it would seem to me that having someone like Mozart, forcing the appreciation of this to a certain feeling seems, I guess, stronger? Maybe it's not. I don't see them as meaningfully different behaviorally. Okay. They are both behaviors. They are both very high-level behaviors. They both involve a high level of cognition and emotion. Okay. People who are good at differential equations, I am not one of them. People <laughs> who are good at differential equations... I mean, have you, you, you've seen the video of brilliant mathematicians describing what it feels like to solve a problem. Yes. That's an emotional high. Exactly. That is the look on a new father's face. Okay. It's the same thing. So if you're good at really hard stuff like this, your body's going to like it. Your brain's going to like it. It's going to have an emotional component. Mozart is obviously going to have an emotional component, but it's also very complex cognitive style of music. Maybe I should have said Beethoven or Bach, but <laughs> Mozart still. So I don't see them as different. I really don't. We, we tend to think of feelings as being more, more abstract or maybe even being more real. And, and, I would say more and, real, but keep in mind that um, physiologically, the way the brain is structured... All that thought stuff, all that cognition stuff, that's cortex, man. That's right. the most recent part of the brain. Right. All the emotions, 
that crap's buried deep. Right. That's been there for a while, man. And it's rats, rats have emotions. Right. Dogs have emotions. We have emotions. And they're, they're really deep and really basic. So it's actually the cognitive part that's actually more difficult. I think so. Mm-hmm. And also the, the thing that makes us human to a large extent, and I, and I have this argument with my students all the time. I'll, I'll usually get somebody who says, why do I have to feel things? Feelings are stupid. Emotions are stupid. They make me do dumb things. And what they want to do is that whole, you know, Star Trek notion. They want to yeah. be Data. They it, want to be yeah. Spock. The ability to just switch off yeah. the emotions. And just think. Wouldn't that make the world a better place? Most psychologists, maybe not most physicists and maybe not most neuroscientists, but most psychologists would say, oh, heavens no. It would be terrible because we have evolved emotions for a reason. They're not a leftover. They're not a problem. They are an integral part of who we are. Right. It's like we behave irrationally, but we behave in emotional ways that we can understand. And emotion does inform cognition in positive ways. Right. Emotion is not the thing to avoid and get over. It is the thing to understand and use. And I hate to use this term because it's pop psych like crazy. But, oh, here we go. I can't believe I'm going to do this. (laughs) Go for it. (laughs) Mindfulness. Okay. I, there I said it. So the I kind did. of meditation yeah, thing. Yeah, nobody aware. held a gun to my head. I said mindfulness of my own free will. Um, <laughs> if you have one. <laughs> if, I have, if I have one, which I may not. Uh, but that notion of being present, being aware of, wow, I am really pissed off. Okay, take a deep breath. Why is that happening? Right. What's going on? Oh, that's why that's going on. All right, man, it's good that I noticed that. It's good I had that emotion because now I know, I understand a lot more of my current state, my current mind, my current right. being. Everybody knows you get into trouble when I'm so angry and I punch somebody in the face or road rage or something. Right. Or right. I'm so excited I go on YouTube or I go on the shopping network or something and buy 10,000 somethings I don't need. Right, right. But what they don't remember is when the emotion and understanding the emotion positively informs their behavior. Mm -hmm. When, how many times have people had exactly the same problem with, I'm not angry, I'm fine. (laughs) Really? Because you're not, and your inability to understand that you're really, really not is a serious problem in your life. Right. If we run away from our emotions, we get worse, we don't get better. And if we lose them, we don't get better, we get worse. Right. We have to have them integrated. Yeah. The integration, which, you know, is mindfulness, is the new way to think about that. It's, it's oh, okay. Yes, let's move on. <laughs> it bothers me. The idea that we're programmable. I mean, it's all kind of like the thing when you mentioned data, for example, mm-hmm. that if a data existed in mm-hmm. the way that data exists in mm-hmm. Star Trek of this kind of autonomous mm-hmm. android, most people would attribute some manner of humanity to him. Intentionality. I'm not sure you'd say Okay, humanity. intentionality. Okay. Um, which raises that discussion of, you know, is a computer mind equivalent to a human mind in the broad sense? Usually it's, you know, would a computer mind have a soul in the way that humans have souls? But, but that idea of could you recreate, if you can really map out it, is it just a matter of patterns, whether they're on wetware or whether they're on silicon? I think it is a matter of patterns. I don't think that the interesting question is human versus data, because I think intelligent, autonomous AI will exist at some point. That scares me, but I think it's true. They will not be human. They will be nothing like human. They will be an intelligent, autonomous species with which we will share the planet until we yeah. you know, kill them with fire. Yeah, we have the, the Google analogy of the self-driving cars exactly. or uh, computer chess games. Here's, Kasparov, he, for example, said he, he felt you know, a that presence was, That was something. in his head, man. That was right. in his head. But the thing that I think is more interesting is you're talking about if you can map an individual human mind completely, that means if we are completely programmable, and we may be, You map memory, you map experience, you map personality. If all it is, is an electrochemical system that is completely understood, you can translate that into a silicon-based system, Mm -hmm. you can download it, you can save it. 
All right, that's the idea of the singularity that happens. Exactly. In, in I mean, science that, you know, fiction. Ray Kurzweil's coughing yeah, his vitamins. Curse, Kurzweil's he, dream. Because he knows it's going to happen. <laughs> Here's my question Is that a human being? Can you hold up a hard drive and say, This is a person? Is smashing that hard drive murder? I think right. it is. I'm a psychologist. I have a certain viewpoint and a certain set of biases, but I think it is. I don't think humanity is in the wetware. I think it's in the patterns, I think it's in the memories and the preferences and the biology and the experiences. So if you copied the hard drive and then destroyed the original, that wouldn't be murder. Probably not. So if you copied a person and destroyed the original person, that also wouldn't be murder. Ooh, that's an interesting <laughs> question now, isn't it? And yes. again, there are, if there are any sci-fi authors or sci-fi readers listening to this, they're jumping up and down and annoyed with this because they're going, yeah, this guy did that book, this guy did that book, this guy did right. that book. Right. It's a common theme. Yeah. You know, it's a but, way of bringing the afterlife in, into science fiction. But I think it's potentially real and valid. I mean, if you can really map the brain at a single neuronal level or whatever lower level is necessary, you can download it. You got a person. So, so it sounds a little bit like you're you're kind of dancing around Pandora's box. That if the, if the neuroscientists and the computer guys actually do discover this, it may be an answer we don't want. Yeah, and I'm enough of a scientist that I don't care, <laughs> or that even if I do care, I have to know. I mean, that's the whole point. You gotta right. know, man. I mean, there's a possibility that consciousness, whatever, assume consciousness exists for a minute. Right. And consciousness is an emergent property of a sufficiently complex cognitive emotional processor. Mm -hmm. It is possible, and this is what I've been thinking about the last couple of weeks, it is possible that we are an evolutionary dead end because we have evolved to be very complex, very capable and competent processors and manipulators and builders and tool right, users right. and then along the way because evolution is a blunt instrument this stupid thing showed up of consciousness. this consciousness thing just showed up it emerged out of all the cool stuff that was being selected for and it's almost like a disease it's almost like a problem and <laughs> it's gonna kill us we're too smart for our own good there's a whole notion of the importance of this stuff the importance can you be an intelligent, autonomous, free-thinking individual, right. computer, human, whatever, and not worry about your place in the universe? Not right. worry about, I may not live, but America will. <laughs> I may not live, but my children will. Right. Can you be that intelligent, tool-using creature and not carry all the baggage of... You dress differently from me. You look differently from me. You sound differently from me. Therefore, My tribe will, needs to yeah, survive over yours. I'm going to kill you. Right. Because I have to. Right. Because it's a biological imperative. It's an evolutionary imperative. Right. But it seems like on the other side, too, is that if we do, in fact, replicate human brains, if not mm -hmm. human minds, one of the other ideas I would is, say replicate persons, whatever okay, that means. Or replicate persons, then. The other idea is that, you know, we're not the end of, a, of evolutionary progression, but there's a transition from biology to silicon and that yep. the mental evolution continues and we're right back chip. to ray kurzweil man yeah we're right back to the singularity he's a little crazy i think ray sorry <laughs> but he's not necessarily wrong <laughs> you've been listening to one universe at a time i'm your host brian coberlein we've been talking with grant guthiel about the probabilistic nature of psychology among other things our program is produced by Mark Gillespie at the Rochester Institute of Technology with support from the RIT College of Science. Thanks for listening to One Universe at a Time.